Part One of The History of the Caliph Vathek. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. The History of the Caliph Vathek by William Beckford. Part One. Vathek, ninth caliph of the race of the Abbasides, was the son of Motassem and the grandson of Harun al-Rashid. From an early accession to the throne and the talents he possessed to adorn it, his subjects were induced to expect that his reign would be long and happy. His figure was pleasing and majestic, but when he was angry one of his eyes became so terrible that no person could bear to behold it, and the wretch upon whom it was fixed instantly fell backward and sometimes expired. For fear, however, of depopulating his dominions and making his palate desolate, he but rarely gave way to his anger. Being much addicted to women and the pleasures of the table, he sought by his affability to procure agreeable companions, and he succeeded the better as his generosity was unbounded, and his indulgences unrestrained, for he was by no means scrupulous, nor did he think with the Caliph Omar ben Abd al-Aziz that it was necessary to make a hell of this world to enjoy paradise in the next. He surpassed in magnificence all his predecessors. The palace of al Koremi, which his father Matassam had erected on the hill of Pied Horses, and which commanded the whole city of Samara, was in his idea far too scanty, kings, or rather other palaces, which he destined for the particular gratification of each of his senses. In the first of these were tables, continually covered with the most exquisite dainties, which were supplied both by night and by day, according to their constant consumption, whilst the most delicious wines and the choicest cordials flowed forth from a hundred fountains that were never exhausted. This place was called the Eternal or Unsatiating Banquet. The second was styled the Temple of Melancholy, or the Nectar of the Soul. It was inhabited by the most skilful musicians and admired poets of the time, who not only displayed their talents within, but, dispersing in bands without, caused every surrounding scene to reverberate their songs, which were continually varied in the most delightful succession. The palace named the Delight of the Eyes, or the Support of Memory, was one entire enchantment. Rarities collected from every corner of the earth were there found in such profusion as to dazzle and confound, but for the order in which they were arranged. One gallery exhibited the pictures of the celebrated Menai, and statues that seemed to be alive. Here a well-managed perspective attracted the sight, there the magic of optics agreeably deceived it, whilst the naturalist on his part exhibited, in their several classes, the various gifts that heaven had bestowed on our globe. In a word, Vathek omitted nothing in this palace that might gratify the curiosity of those who resorted to it, although he was not able to satisfy his own for he was of all men the most curious. The Palace of Perfumes, which was termed likewise the incentive to pleasure, consisted of various halls, where the different perfumes which the earth produces were kept perpetually burning in censers of gold. Flambeaux and aromatic lamps were here lighted in open day. But the two powerful effects of this agreeable delirium might be avoided by descending into an immense garden, where an assemblage of every fragrant flower diffused through the air the purest of odours. The fifth palace, denominated the Retreat of Joy, or the Dangerous, was frequented by troops of young females beautiful as the Houris, and not less seducing, who never failed to receive with caresses all whom the Caliph allowed to approach them, for he was by no means disposed to be jealous, as his own women were secluded within the palace he inhabited himself. Notwithstanding the sensuality in which Vathek indulged, he experienced no abatement in the love of his people, who thought that a sovereign immersed in pleasure was not less tolerable to his subjects than one that employed himself in creating them foes. But the unquiet and impetuous disposition of the caliph would not allow him to rest there. He had studied so much for his amusement in the lifetime of his father as to acquire a great deal of knowledge, though not a sufficiency to satisfy himself for he wished to know everything, even sciences that did not exist. He was fond of engaging in disputes with the learned, but liked them not to push their opposition with warmth. 
he stopped the mouths of those with presents whose mouths could be stopped, whilst others, whom his liberality was unable to subdue, he sent to prison to cool their blood, a remedy that often succeeded. Vathek discovered also a predilection for theological controversy, but it was not with the orthodox that he usually held. By this means he induced the zealots to oppose him, and then persecuted them in return, for he resolved at any rate to have reason on his side. The great prophet Mahomet, whose vicars the caliphs are, beheld with indignation from his abode in the seventh heaven the irreligious conduct of such a vice-regent. "'Let us leave him to himself,' said he to the genii, who are always ready to receive his commands. "'Let us see to what lengths his folly and impiety will carry him. If he run into excess we shall know how to chastise him. Assist him, therefore, to complete the tower which, in imitation of Nimrod, he hath begun, not like that great warrior to escape being drowned, but from the insolent curiosity of penetrating the secrets of heaven. He will not divine the fate that awaits him. The genii obeyed, and when the workmen had raised their structure a cubit in the daytime, two cubits more were added in the night. The expedition with which the fabric arose was not a little flattering to the vanity of Vathek. He fancied that even insensible matter showed a forwardness to subserve his designs, not considering that the successors of the foolish and wicked formed the first rod of their chastisement. His pride arrived at its height when, having ascended for the first time the eleven thousand stairs of his tower, he cast his eyes behold, and beheld men not larger than pismires, mountains than shells, and cities than beehives. The idea which such an elevation inspired of his own grandeur completely bewildered him. He was almost ready to adore himself, till, Lifting his eyes upward, he saw the stars as high above him as they appeared when he stood on the surface of the earth. He consoled himself, however, for this transient perception of his littleness, with the thought of being great in the eyes of others, and flattered himself that the light of his mind would extend beyond the reach of his sight, and transfer to the stars the decrees of his destiny. With this view the inquisitive prince passed most of his nights on the summit of his tower, till he became an adept in the mysteries of astrology, and imagined that the planets had disclosed to him the most marvellous adventures, which were to be accomplished by an extraordinary personage from a country altogether unknown. Prompted by motives of curiosity, he had always been courteous to strangers, but from this instant he redoubled his attention, and ordered it to be announced by sound of trumpet, through all the streets of Samara, that no one of his subjects, on peril of his displeasure, should either lodge or detain a traveller, but forthwith bring him to the palace. Not long after this proclamation, there arrived in his metropolis a man so hideous that the very guards who arrested him were forced to shut their eyes as they led him along. The caliph himself appeared startled at so horrible a visage, but joy succeeded to this emotion of terror when the stranger displayed to his view such rarities as he had never before seen and of which he had no conception. In reality, nothing was ever so extraordinary as the merchandise this stranger produced. Most of his curiosities, which were not less admirable for their workmanship than splendour, had, besides, their several virtues described on a parchment fastened to each. There were slippers which enabled the feet to walk, knives that out without the motion of a hand, sabres which dealt the blow at the person they were wished to strike, and the whole enriched with gems that were hitherto unknown. The sabres, whose blades emitted a dazzling radiance, fixed more than all the caliph's attention, which promised himself to decipher at his leisure the uncouth characters engraven on their sides. Without, therefore, demanding their price, he ordered all the coined gold to be brought from his treasury, and commanded the merchant to take what he pleased. The stranger complied with modesty and silence. Vathek, Imagining that the merchant's taciturnity was occasioned by the awe which his presence inspired, encouraged him to advance, and asked him, with an air of condescension, who he was, whence he came, and where he obtained such beautiful commodities. The man, or rather monster, instead of making a reply, thrice rubbed his forehead, which, as well as his body, was blacker than ebony, four times clapped his paunch, the projection of which was enormous opened wide his huge eyes, which glowed like firebrands, began to laugh with a hideous noise, 
and discovered his long amber-coloured teeth bestreaked with green. The caliph, though a little startled, renewed his inquiries, but without being able to procure a reply, at which, beginning to be ruffled, he exclaimed, "'Knowest thou, varlet, who I am, and at whom thou art aiming thy jibes?' Then, addressing his guards, "'Have ye heard him speak? Is he dumb?' "'He hath spoken,' they replied, "'though but little.' "'Let him speak again, then,' said Vathek, "'and tell me who he is, from whence he came, "'and where he procured these singular curiosities, "'or I swear by the ass of Balaam "'that I will make him rue his pertinacity.' "'The menace was accompanied by the caliph "'with one of his angry and perilous glances, "'which the stranger sustained without the slightest emotion, "'although his eyes were fixed on the terrible eye of the prince.' No words can describe the amazement of the courtiers when they beheld this rude merchant withstand the encounter unshocked. They all fell prostrate with their faces on the ground to avoid the risk of their lives, and continued in the same abject posture till the caliph exclaimed in a furious tone, "'Up, cowards! Seize the miscreant! See that he be committed to prison and guarded by the best of my soldiers! Let him, however, retain the money I gave him. It is not my intent to take from him his property.' I only want to hear him speak. No sooner had he uttered these words than the stranger was surrounded, pinioned with strong fetters, and hurried away to the prison of the great tower, which was encompassed by seven impalements of iron bars, and armed with spikes in every direction longer and sharper than spits. The caliph, nevertheless, remained in the most violent agitation. He sat down, indeed, to eat, but of the three hundred covers that were daily placed before him, he could taste of no more than thirty-two. A diet to which he had been so little accustomed was sufficient of itself to prevent him from sleeping. What then must be its effect when joined to the anxiety that preyed upon his spirits? At the first glimpse of dawn he hastened to the prison, again to importune this intractable stranger. But the rage of Vathek exceeded all bounds. On finding the prison empty, the gates burst asunder, and his guards lying lifeless around him. In the paroxysm of his passion he fell furiously on the poor carcasses, and kicked them till evening without intermission. His courtiers and viziers exerted their efforts to soothe his extravagance, but finding every expedient ineffectual, they all united in one vociferation. The caliph is gone mad! The caliph is out of his senses! This outcry, which soon resounded through the streets of Samara, at length reaching the ears of Carathis, his mother, she flew in the utmost consternation to try her ascendancy on the mind of her son. Her tears and caresses called off his attention, and he was prevailed upon by her entreaties to be brought back to the palace. Carathis, apprehensive of leaving Vathek to himself, caused him to be put to bed and, seating herself by him, endeavoured by her conversation to heal and compose him. Nor could any one have attempted it with better success, for the caliph not only loved her as a mother, but respected her as a person of superior genius. It was she who had induced him, being a Greek herself, to adopt all the sciences and systems of her country, which good Mussulmans hold in such thorough abhorrence. Judicial astrology was one of those systems in which Carathis was a perfect adept. She began, therefore, with reminding her son of the promise which the stars had made him, and intimated an intention of consulting them again. Alas, sighed the caliph as soon as he could speak, what a fool have I been, not for the kicks bestowed on my guards who so tamely submitted to death, but for never considering that this extraordinary man was the same the planets had foretold, whom, instead of ill-treating, I should have conciliated by all the arts of persuasion. The past, said Carathis, cannot be recalled, but it behoves us to think of the future. Perhaps you may again see the object you so much regret. It is possible the inscriptions on the sabres will afford information. Eat, therefore, and take thy repose, my dear son. We will consider to-morrow in what manner to act. Vathek yielded to her counsel as well as he could, and arose in the morning with a mind more at ease. The sabres he commanded to be instantly brought, 
and pouring upon them through a green glass, that their glittering might not dazzle, he set himself in earnest to decipher the ins inscriptions. But his reiterated attempts were all of them nugatory. In vain did he beat his head and bite his nails. Not a letter of the whole was he able to ascertain. So unlucky a disappointment would have undone him again, had not Carathis by good fortune entered the apartment. "'Have patience, son,' said she. "'You certainly are possessed of every important science, but the knowledge of languages is a trifle at best, and the accomplishment of none but a pedant. Issue forth a proclamation that you will confer such rewards as become your greatness upon any one that shall interpret what you do not understand, and what it is beneath you to learn, you will soon find your curiosity gratified. That may be, said the caliph, but in the meantime I shall be horribly disgusted by a crowd of smatterers, who will come to the trial as much for the pleasure of retailing their jargon as from the hope of gaining the reward. To avoid this evil it will be proper to add that I will put every candidate to death who shall fail to give satisfaction, for, thank heaven, I have skill enough to distinguish between one that translates and one that invents. Of that I have no doubt, replied Carathis, but to put the ignorant to death is somewhat severe, and may be productive of dangerous effects. Content yourself with commanding their beards to be burnt. Beards in a state are not quite so essential as men. The caliph submitted to the reasons of his mother, and sending for Morkanabad, his prime vizier, said, Let the common cries proclaim, not only in Samara, but throughout every city in my empire, that whosoever will repair hither, and decipher certain characters which appear to be inexplicable, shall experience the liberality for which I am renowned, but that all who fail upon trial shall have their beards burnt off to the last hair. Let them add also that I will bestow fifty beautiful slaves, and as many jars of apricots from the Isle of Kermith, upon any man that shall bring me intelligence of the stranger. The subjects of the caliph, like their sovereign, being great admirers of women and the apricots from Kermith, felt their mouths water at these promises, but were totally unable to gratify their hankering, for no one knew which way the stranger had gone. As to the caliph's other requisition, the result was different. The learned, the half-learned, and those who were neither, but fancied themselves equal to both, came boldly to hazard their beards, and all shamefully lost them. The exaction of these forfeitures, which found sufficient employment for the eunuchs, gave them such a smell of singed hair as greatly to disgust the ladies of the seraglio, and make it necessary that this new occupation of their guardians should be transferred into other hands. At length, however, an old man presented himself whose beard was a cubit and a half longer than any that had appeared before him. The officers of the palace whispered to each other as they ushered him in. What a pity such a beard should be burnt! Even the caliph, when he saw it, concurred with them in opinion, but his concern was entirely needless. This venerable personage read the characters with facility, and explained them verbatim as follows. We were made where everything good is made. We are the least of the wonders of a place where all is wonderful, and deserving the sight of the first potentate on earth. You translate admirably, cried Vathek. I know to what these marvellous characters allude. Let him receive as many robes of honour and thousands of sequins of gold as he has spoken words. I am in some measure relieved from the perplexity that embarrassed me. Vathek invited the old man to dine, and even to remain some days in the palace. Unluckily for him he accepted the offer, for the caliph, having ordered him next morning to be called, said, Read again to me what you have read already. I cannot hear too often the promise that is made me, the completion of which I languish to obtain. The old man forthwith put on his green spectacles but they instantly dropped from his nose on perceiving that the characters he had read the day preceding had given place to others of a different import. "'What ails you?' asked the caliph. "'And why these symptoms of wonder?' "'Sovereign of the world,' replied the old man, "'these savours hold another language to-day from what they yesterday held.' 
"'How say you?' returned Vathek. "'But it matters not. "'Tell me, if you can, what they mean.' "'It is this, my lord,' rejoined the old man. "'Woe to the rash mortal who seeks to know "'that of which he should remain ignorant, "'and to undertake that which surpasseth his power.' "'And woe to me!' cried the caliph, in a burst of indignation. "'To-day thou art void of understanding. "'Be gone from my presence. "'They shall burn but half of thy beard, "'because thou wert yesterday fortunate in guessing. "'My gifts I never resume.' "'The old man, wise enough to perceive he had luckily escaped, "'considering the folly of disclosing so disgusting a truth, "'immediately withdrew, and appeared not again.' but it was not long before Vathek discovered abundant reason to regret his precipitation, for though he could not decipher the characters himself, yet by constantly poring upon them he plainly perceived that they every day changed, and unfortunately no other candidate offered to explain them. This perplexing occupation inflamed his blood, dazzled his sight, and brought on a giddiness and debility that he could not support. He failed not, however, though in so reduced a condition, to be often carried to his tower, as he flattered himself that he might there read in the stars which he went to consult something more congenial to his wishes. But in this his hopes were deluded, for his eyes, dimmed by the vapours of his head, began to subserve his curiosity so ill that he beheld nothing but a thick, dun cloud, which he took for the most direful of omens. End of Part 1《Part Two of the History of the Caliph Vathek by William Beckford. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. The History of the Caliph Vathek by William Beckford. Part Two. Agitated with so much anxiety, Vathek entirely lost all firmness. A fever seized him, and his appetite failed. Instead of being one of the greatest eaters, he became as distinguished for drinking. So insatiable was the thirst which tormented him that his mouth, like a funnel, was always open to receive the various liquors that might be poured into it, and especially cold water, which calmed him more than every other. This unhappy prince, being thus incapacitated for the enjoyment of any pleasure, commanded the palaces of the five senses to be shut up, forbore to appear in public, either to display his magnificence or administer justice, and retired to the inmost apartment of his harem. As he had ever been an indulgent husband, his wives, overwhelmed with grief at his deplorable situation, incessantly offered their prayers for his health, and unremittingly supplied him with water. In the meantime, the Princess Carathis, whose affliction no words can describe, instead of restraining herself to sobbing and tears, was closeted daily with the vizier Morakanabad, to find out some cure or mitigation of the caliph's disease. Under the persuasion that it was caused by enchantment, they turned over together, leaf by leaf, all the books of magic that might point out a remedy, and caused the horrible stranger, whom they accused as the enchanter, to be everywhere sought for with the strictest diligence. At the distance of a few miles from Samara stood a high mountain, whose sides were swarded with wild thyme and basil, and its summit overspread with so delightful a plain, that it might be taken for the paradise destined for the faithful. Upon it grew a hundred thickets of eglantine and other fragrant shrubs, a hundred arbours of roses, jessamine and honeysuckle, as many clumps of orange trees, cedar and citron, whose branches, interwoven with the palm, the pomegranate and the vine, presented every luxury that could regale the eye or the taste. The ground was strewed with violets, harebells and pansies, in the midst of which sprang forth tufts of jonquils, hyacinths and carnations, with every other perfume that impregnates the air. Four fountains, not less clear than deep, and so abundant as to slake the thirst of ten armies, seemed profusely placed here to make the scene more resemble the Garden of Eden, which was watered by the four sacred rivers. Here the nightingale sang the birth of the rose, her well-beloved, and at the same time lamented its short-lived beauty, whilst the turtle deplored the loss of more substantial pleasures, and the wakeful lark 
hailed the rising light that reanimates the whole creation. Here more than anywhere, the mingled melodies of the birds expressed the various passions they inspired, as if the exquisite fruits which they pecked at pleasure had given them a double energy. To this mountain Vathek was sometimes brought for the sake of breathing a purer air, and especially to drink at will of the four fountains, which were reputed in the highest degree salubrious and sacred to himself. His attendants were his mother, his wives, and some eunuchs, who assiduously employed themselves in filling capacious bowls of rock crystal, and emulously presenting them to him. But it frequently happened that his avidity exceeded their zeal, insomuch that he would prostrate himself upon the ground to lap up the water, of which he could never have enough. One day, when this unhappy prince had been long lying in so debasing a posture, a voice, hoarse but strong, thus addressed him. Why assumest thou the function of a dog, O Caliph, so proud of thy dignity and power? At this apostrophe he raised his head, and beheld the stranger that had caused him so much affliction. Inflamed with anger at the sight, he exclaimed, Accursed Jaor, what comest thou hither to do? Is it not enough to have transformed a prince remarkable for his agility into one of those leather barrels which the Bedouin Arabs carry on their camels when they traverse the deserts? Perceivest thou not that I may perish by drinking to excess no less than by a total abstinence? Drink then this draught, said the stranger, as he presented to him a phial of a red and yellow mixture, and, to satiate the thirst of thy soul as well as of thy body, know that I am an Indian but from a region of India which is wholly unknown. The caliph delighted to see his desires accomplished in part, and flattering himself with the hope of obtaining their entire fulfilment, without a moment's hesitation swallowed the potion, and instantly found his health restored, his thirst appeased, and his limbs as agile as ever. In the transports of his joy, Vathek leapt upon the neck of the frightful Indian, and kissed his horrid mouth and hollow cheeks, as though they had been the coral lips and the lilies and roses of his most beautiful wives, whilst they, less terrified than jealous at the sight, dropped their veils to hide the blush of mortification that suffused their foreheads. Nor would the scene have closed here, had not Carathis, with all the art of insinuation, a little repressed the raptures of her son. Having prevailed upon him to return to Samara, she caused the herald to precede him, whom she commanded to proclaim as loudly as possible. The wonderful stranger hath appeared again, he hath healed the caliph, he hath spoken, he hath spoken. Forthwith all the inhabitants of this vast city quitted their habitations, and ran together in crowds to see the procession of Vathek and the Indian, whom they now blessed as much as they had before execrated, incessantly shouting, He hath healed our sovereign, he hath spoken, he hath spoken. Nor were these words forgotten in the public festivals which were celebrated the same evening, to testify the general joy, for the poets applied them as a chorus to all the songs they composed. The caliph in the meanwhile caused the palaces of the senses to be again set open, and as he found himself prompted to visit that of taste in preference to the rest, immediately ordered a splendid entertainment, to which his great officers and favourite courtiers were all invited. The Indian, who was placed near the palace, seemed to think that as a proper acknowledgment of so distinguished a privilege he could neither eat, drink, nor talk too much. The various dainties were no sooner served up than they vanished, to the great mortification of Vathek, who piqued himself on being the greatest eater alive, and at this time in particular had an excellent appetite. The rest of the company looked round at each other in amazement, but the Indian, without appearing to observe it, quaffed large bumpers to the health of each of them, sung in a style altogether extravagant, related stories at which he laughed immoderately, and poured forth extemporaneous verses, which would not have been thought bad but for the strange grimaces with which they were uttered. In a word, his loquacity was equal to that of a hundred astrologers, he ate as much as a hundred porters, and caroused in proportion. The caliph, notwithstanding the table had been thirty times covered, found himself incommoded by the voraciousness of his guest, who was now considerably declined in the prince's esteem. Vathek, however, being unwilling to betray the chagrin he could hardly disguise, said in a whisper to Bababalouk, the chief of his eunuchs, You see how enormous his performances in every way are. 
what would be the consequence should he get at my wives go redouble your vigilance and be sure to look well to my circassians who would be more to his taste than all of the rest the bird of the morning had thrice renewed his song when the hour of the divan sounded vathek in gratitude to his subjects having promised to attend immediately rose from the table and repaired thither leaning upon his vizier who could scarcely support him so disordered was the poor prince by the wine he had drunk and still more by the extravagant vagaries of his boisterous guest the viziers the officers of the crown and of the law arranged themselves in a semicircle about their sovereign and preserved a respectful silence whilst the indian who looked as cool as if come from a fast sat down without ceremony on the step of the throne laughing in his sleeve at the indignation with which his temerity had filled the spectators the caliph however whose ideas were confused and his head embarrassed went on administering justice at haphazard till at length the prime vizier perceiving his situation hit upon a sudden expedient to interrupt the audience and rescue the honour of his master to whom he said in a whisper my lord the princess carathis who hath passed the night in consulting the planets informs you that they portend you evil and the danger is urgent beware lest this stranger whom you have so lavishly recompensed for his magical gewgaws should make some attempt on your life his liquor which at first had the appearance of effecting your cure may be no more than a poison of a sudden operation slight not this surmise ask him at least of what it was compounded whence he procured it and mention the sabres which you seem to have forgotten vathek to whom the insolent airs of the stranger became every moment less supportable intimated to his vizier by a wink of acquiescence that he would adopt his advice and at once turning towards the indian said get up and declare in full divan of what drugs the liquor was compounded you enjoined me to take for it is suspected to be poison add also the explanation i have so earnestly desired concerning the sabres you sold me and thus show your gratitude for the favours heaped upon you having pronounced these words in as moderate a tone as a caliph well could he waited in silent expectation for an answer but the indian still keeping his seat began to renew his loud shouts of laughter and exhibit the same horrid grimaces he had shown them before without much saving a word in reply vathek no longer able to brook such insolence immediately kicked him from the steps instantly descending repeated his blow and persisted with such assiduity as incited all who were present to follow his example every foot was aimed at the indian and no sooner had any one given him a kick than he felt himself constrained to reiterate the stroke the stranger afforded them no small entertainment for being both short and plump he collected himself into a ball and rolled around on all sides at the blows of his assailants who pressed after him wherever he turned with an eagerness beyond conception whilst their numbers were every moment increasing the ball indeed in passing from one apartment to another drew every person after it that came its way insomuch that the whole palace was thrown into confusion and resounded with a tremendous clamour the women of the harem amazed at the uproar flew to their blinds to discover the cause but no sooner did they catch a glimpse of the ball than feeling themselves unable to refrain they broke from the clutches of their eunuchs who to stop their flight pinched them till they bled but in vain whilst themselves though trembling with terror at the escape of their charge were as incapable of resisting the attraction the indian after having traversed the halls galleries chambers kitchens gardens and stables of the palace at last took his course through the courts whilst the caliph pursuing him closer than the rest bestowed as many kicks as he possibly could yet not without receiving now and then one which his competitors in their eagerness designed for the ball carathis morakanabad and two or three old viziers whose wisdom had hitherto withstood the attraction wishing to prevent vathek from exposing himself in the presence of his subjects fell down in his way to impede the pursuit but he regardless of their obstruction leapt over their heads and went on as before they then ordered the muezzins to call the people to prayers both for the sake of getting them out of the way and of endeavouring by their petitions to avert the calamity but neither of these expedients was a whit more successful the sight of this fatal ball was alone sufficient to draw after it every beholder the muezzins themselves 
though they saw it but at a distance, hastened down from their minarets and mixed with the crowd, which continued to increase in so surprising a manner that scarce an inhabitant was left in Samara, except the aged, the sick confined to their beds, and infants at the breast, whose nurses could run more nimbly without them. Even Carathis, Morakanabad, and the rest were all become of the party. The shrill screams of the females, who had broken from their apartments and were unable to extricate themselves from the pressure of the crowd, together with those of the eunuchs jostling after them, terrified lest their charge should escape from their sight, increased by the execrations of husbands urging forward and menacing both, kicks given and received, stumblings and overthrows at every step. In a word, the confusion that universally prevailed rendered Samara like a city taken by storm and devoted to absolute plunder. At last the cursed Indian, who still preserved his rotundity of figure, after passing through all the streets and public places, and leaving them empty, rolled onwards to the plain of Catul, and traversed the valley at the foot of the mountains of the Four Fountains. As a continual fall of water had excavated an immense gulf in the valley, whose opposite side was closed in by a steep acclivity, the caliph and his attendants were apprehensive lest the ball should bound into the chasm, and, to prevent it, redoubled their efforts. But in vain. The Indian persevered in his onward direction, and, as had been apprehended, glancing from the precipice with the rapidity of lightning, was lost in the gulf below. Vathek would have followed the perfidious Jeor, had not an invisible agency arrested his progress. The multitude that pressed after him were at once checked in the same manner, and a calm instantaneously ensued. They all gazed at each other with an air of astonishment, and notwithstanding that the loss of veils and turbans, together with torn habits and dust blended with sweat, presented a most laughable spectacle, there was not one smile to be seen. On the contrary, all, with looks of confusion and sadness, returned in silence to Samara, and retired to their inmost apartments, without ever reflecting that they had been impelled by an invisible power into the extravagance for which they reproached themselves. For it is but just that men, who so often arrogate to their own merit the good of which they are but instruments, should attribute to themselves the absurdities which they could not prevent. The caliph was the only person that refused to leave the valley. He commanded his tents to be pitched there, and stationed himself on the very edge of the precipice, in spite of the representations of Carathis and Morakanabad, who pointed out the hazard of its brink giving way, and the vicinity to the magician that had so severely tormented him. Vathek derided all their remonstrances, and, having ordered a thousand flambeaux to be lighted, and directed his attendants to proceed in lighting more, lay down on the slippery margin, and attempted, by help of this artificial splendour, to look through that gloom which all the fires of the Empyrean had been insufficient to pervade. One while he fancied to himself voices arising from the depth of the gulf. At another he seemed to distinguish the accents of the Indian. But all was no more than the hollow murmur of waters, and the din of the cataracts that rushed from steep to steep down the sides of the mountain. End of Part 2 Part Three of the History of the Caliph Vathek by William Beckford. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. Having passed the night in this cruel perturbation, the Caliph at daybreak retired to his tent, where, without taking the least sustenance, he continued to doze till the dusk of evening began again to come on. He then resumed his vigils as before and persevered in observing them for many nights together. At length, fatigued with so successless an employment, he sought relief from change. To this end he sometimes paced with hasty strides across the plain, and as he wildly gazed at the stars, reproached them with having deceived him. But lo! on a sudden the clear blue sky appeared streaked over with streams of blood, which reached from the valley even to the city of Samara. As this awful phenomenon seemed to touch his tower, Vathek at first thought of repairing thither to view it more distinctly, but feeling himself unable to advance, and being overcome with apprehension, he muffled up his face in his robe. Terrifying as these prodigies were, this impression upon him was no more than momentary, 
and served only to stimulate his love of the marvellous. Instead, therefore, of returning to his palace, he persisted in the resolution of abiding where the Indian vanished from his view. One night, however, while he was walking, as usual, on the plain, the moon and the stars at once were eclipsed, and a total darkness ensued. The earth trembled beneath him, and a voice came forth, the voice of the Gyao, who, in accents more sonorous than thunder, thus addressed him. Wouldest thou devote thyself to me? Adore, then, the terrestrial influences, and abjure Mahomet. On these conditions I will bring thee to the palace of subterranean fire. There shalt thou behold in immense depositories the treasures which the stars have promised thee, and which will be conferred by those intelligences whom thou shalt thus render propitious. It was from thence I brought my sabres, and it is there that Solomon ben Daoud reposes, surrounded by the talismans that control the world. The astonished caliph trembled as he answered, yet in a style that showed him to be no novice in preternatural adventures. Where art thou? Be present to my eyes. Dissipate the gloom that perplexes me, and of which I deem thee the cause. After the many flambeaux I have burnt to discover thee, thou mayst at least grant a glimpse of thy horrible visage. Abjure then, Mahomet, replied the Indian, and promise me full proofs of thy sincerity, otherwise thou shalt never behold me again. The unhappy caliph, instigated by insatiable curiosity, lavished his promises in the utmost profusion. The sky immediately brightened, and by the light of the planets, which seemed almost to blaze, Vathek beheld the earth open, and at the extremity of a vast black chasm, a portal of ebony, before which stood the Indian, still blacker, holding in his hand a golden key that caused the lock to resound. How, cried Vathek, can I descend to thee without the certainty of breaking my neck? Come, take me and instantly opened the portal. Not so fast, replied the Indian. Impatient caliph, know that I am parched with thirst, and cannot open this door till my thirst be thoroughly appeased. I require the blood of fifty of the most beautiful sons of thy viziers and great men, or neither can my thirst nor thy curiosity be satisfied. Return to Samara, Procure for me this necessary libation. Come back hither, throw it thyself into this chasm, and then shalt thou see. Having thus spoken, the Indian turned his back on the caliph, who, incited by the suggestion of demons, resolved on the direful sacrifice. He now pretended to have regained his tranquillity, and set out for Samara amidst the acclamations of a people who still loved him, and forbore not to rejoice when they believed him to have recovered his reason. So successfully did he conceal the emotion of his heart, that even Carathis and Morakanabad were equally deceived with the rest. Nothing was heard of but festivals and rejoicings. The ball, which no tongue had hitherto ventured to mention, was again brought on the tapis. A general laugh went round, though many still smarting under the hands of the surgeon from the hurts received in that memorable adventure, had no great reason for mirth. The prevalence of this gay humour was not a little grateful to Vathek, as perceiving how much it conduced to his project. He put on the appearance of affability to every one, but especially to his viziers and the grandees of his court, whom he failed not to regale with a sumptuous banquet during which he insensibly inclined the conversation to the children of his guests. Having asked with a good-natured air who of them were blessed with the handsomest boys, every father at once asserted the pretensions of his own, and the constant imperceptibility grew so warm that nothing could have withholden them from coming to blows but their profound reverence for the person of the caliph. Under the pretense, therefore, of reconciling the disputants, Vathek took upon him to decide, and with this view commanded the boys to be brought. It was not long before a troop of these poor children made their appearance, all equipped by their fond mothers with such ornaments as might give the greatest relief to their beauty, 
or most advantageously display the graces of their age. But whilst this brilliant assemblage attracted the eyes and hearts of every one besides, the caliph scrutinized each in his turn with a malignant avidity that passed for attention, and selected from their number the fifty whom he judged a giaour would prefer. With an equal show of kindness as before, he proposed to celebrate a festival on the plain for the entertainment of his young favourites, who he said ought to rejoice still more than all at the restoration of his health, on account of the favours he intended for them. The caliph's proposal was received with the greatest delight, and soon published through Samara. Litters, camels and horses were prepared. Women and children, old men and young, everyone placed himself in the station he chose. The cavalcade set forward, attended by all the confectioners in the city and its precincts. The populace following on foot composed an amazing crowd, and occasioned no little noise. All was joy, nor did any one call to mind what most of them had suffered when they first travelled the road they were now passing so gaily. The evening was serene, the air refreshing, the sky clear, and the flowers exhaled their fragrance. The beams of the declining sun, whose mild splendour reposed on the summit of the mountain, shed a glow of ruddy light over its green declivity, and the white flocks sporting upon it. No sounds were audible save the murmurs of the four fountains, and the reeds and voices of shepherds calling to each other from different eminences. The lovely innocence proceeding to the destined sacrifice added not a little to the hilarity of the scene. They approached the plain full of sportiveness, some coursing butterflies, others culling flowers, or picking up the shining little pebbles that attracted their notice. At intervals they nimbly started from each other for the sake of being caught again, and mutually imparting a thousand caresses. The dreadful chasm at whose bottom the portal of ebony was placed began to appear at a distance. It looked like a black streak that divided the plain. Morakanabad and his companions took it for some work which the caliph had ordered. Unhappy men! Little did they surmise for what it was destined. Vathek, not liking they should examine it too nearly, stopped the procession and ordered a spacious circle to be formed on this side at some distance from the accursed chasm. The bodyguard of eunuchs was detached to measure out the lists intended for the games and prepare ringles for the lines to keep off the crowd. The fifty competitors were soon stripped and presented to the admiration of the spectators the suppleness and grace of their delicate limbs. Their eyes sparkled with a joy which those of their fond parents reflected. Everyone offered wishes for the little candidate nearest his heart, and doubted not of his being victorious. A breathless suspense awaited the contest of these amiable and innocent victims. The caliph, awaiting himself of the first moment to retire from the crowd, advanced towards the chasm, and there heard, yet not without shuddering, the voice of the Indian who, gnashing his teeth, eagerly demanded, "'Where are they? Where are they?' Perceivest thou not how my mouth waters? Relentless cure, answered Vathek with emotion. Can nothing content thee but the massacre of these lovely victims? Ah, wert thou to behold their beauty, it most certainly move thy compassion. Perdition on thy compassion, babbler, cried the Indian. Give them me, instantly give them, or my portal shall be closed against thee for ever. Not so loudly replied the caliph, blushing. "'I understand thee,' returned the giaour, with the grin of an ogre. "'Thou wantest to summon up more presence of mind. I will for a moment forbear.' During this exquisite dialogue the games went forward with all alacrity, and at length concluded just as the twilight began to overcast the mountains. Vathek, who was still standing on the edge of the chasm, called out with all his might, let my fifty little favourites approach me separately, and let them come in the order of their success. To the first I will give my diamond bracelet, to the second my collar of emeralds, to the third my aigret of rubies, to the fourth my girdle of topazes, and to the rest each a part of my dress, even down to my slippers. This declaration was received with reiterated acclamations, 
and all extolled the liberality of a prince who would thus strip himself for the amusement of his subjects and the encouragement of the rising generation the caliph in the meantime undressed himself by degrees and raising his arm as high as he was able made each of the prizes glitter in the air but whilst he delivered it with one hand to the child who sprang forward to receive it he with the other pushed the poor innocent into the gulf where the giaour with a sullen muttering incessantly repeated more more this dreadful device was executed with so much dexterity that the boy who was approaching him remained unconscious of the fate of his forerunner and as to the spectators the shades of evening together with their distance precluded them from perceiving any object distinctly vathek having in this manner thrown in the last of the fifty and expecting that the giaour on receiving them would have presented the key already fancied himself as great as solomon and consequently above being amenable for what he had done when to his utter amazement the chasm closed and the ground became as entire as the rest of the plain no language could express his rage and despair he execrated the perfidy of the indian loaded him with his most infamous invectives and stamped with his foot as resolving to be heard he persisted in this demeanour till his strength failed him and then fell on the earth like one void of sense his viziers and grandees who were nearer than the rest supposed him at first to be sitting on the grass at play with their amiable children but at length prompted by doubt they advanced towards the spot and found the caliph alone who wildly demanded what they wanted our children our children cried they it is assuredly pleasant said he to make me accountable for accidents your children while at play fell from the precipice that was here and i should have experienced their fate had i not been saved by a sudden start back at these words the fathers of the fifty boys cried out aloud the mothers repeated their exclamations an octave higher whilst the rest without knowing the cause soon drowned the voices of both with still louder lamentations of their own our caliph said they and the report soon circulated our caliph has played us this trick to gratify his accursed giaour let us punish him for his perfidy let us avenge ourselves let us avenge the blood of the innocent let us throw this cruel prince into the gulf that is near and let his name be mentioned no more at this rumour and these menaces carathis full of consternation hastened to morakanabad and said vizier thou have lost two beautiful boys and must necessarily be the most afflicted of fathers but you are virtuous save your master i will brave every hazard replied the vizier to rescue him from his present danger but afterwards will abandon him to his fate bababalouk continued he put yourself at the head of your eunuchs disperse the mob and if possible bring back this unhappy prince to his palace bababalouk and his fraternity felicitating each other in a low voice on their disability of ever being fathers obeyed the mandate of the vizier who seconding their exertions to the utmost of his power at length accomplished his generous enterprise and retired as he resolved to lament at his leisure no sooner had the caliph re-entered his palace than carathis commanded the doors to be fastened but perceiving the tumult to be still violent and hearing the imprecations which resounded from all quarters she said to her son whether the populace be right or wrong it behoves you to provide for your safety let us retire to your own apartment and from thence to the subterranean passage known only to ourselves into your tower there with the assistance of the mutes who never leave it we may be able to make some resistance bababalouk supposing us to be still in the palace will guard its avenues for his own sake and we shall soon find without the counsels of that lover morakanabad what expedient may be the best to adopt vathek without making the least reply acquiesced in his mother's proposal and repeated as he went nefarious giaour where art thou hast thou not yet devoured those poor children where are thy sabres thy golden keys thy talismans 
Carathis, who guessed from these interrogations a part of the truth, had no difficulty to apprehend in getting at the whole, as soon as he should be a little composed in his tower. This princess was so far from being influenced by scruples, that she was as wicked as woman could be, which is not saying a little, for the sex pique themselves on their superiority in every competition. The recital of the caliph, therefore, occasioned neither terror nor surprise to his mother. She felt no emotion but from the promises of the Gior, and said to her son, This Gior, it must be confessed, is somewhat sanguinary in his taste, but the terrestrial powers are always terrible. Nevertheless, what the one has promised and the others can confer will prove a sufficient indemnification. No crimes should be thought too dear for such a reward. Forbear, then, to revile the Indian. You have not fulfilled the conditions to which his services are annexed. For instance, is not a sacrifice to the subterranean genii required? And should we not be prepared to offer it as soon as the tumult is subsided? This charge I will take on myself, and have no doubt of succeeding by means of your treasures, which, as there are now so many others in store, may without fear be exhausted. Accordingly, the princess, who possessed the most consummate skill in the art of persuasion, went immediately back through the subterranean passage, and presenting herself to the populace from a window of the palace, began to harangue them with all the address of which she was mistress, whilst Bababalu showered money from both hands amongst the crowd, who by these united means were soon appeased. Every person retired to his home, and Carathis retired to the tower. Prayer at break of day was announced when Carathis and Vathek ascended the steps which led to the summit of the tower, where they remained for some time, though the weather was lowering and wet. This impending gloom corresponded with their malignant dispositions, but when the sun began to break through the clouds they ordered a pavilion to be raised, as a screen from the intrusion of his beams. The caliph, overcome with fatigue, sought refreshment from repose, at the same time hoping that significant dreams might attend on his slumbers, whilst the indefatigable Carathis, followed by a party of her mutes, descended to prepare whatever she judged proper for the oblation of the approaching night. End of part three. Part four of The History of the Caliph Vathek by William Beckford this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Morgan Scorpion By secret stairs, known only to herself and to her son, she first repaired to the mysterious recesses in which were deposited the mummies that had been brought from the catacombs of the ancient pharaohs. Of these she ordered several to be taken. From thence she resorted to a gallery where, under the guard of fifty female negroes, mute and blind of the right eye, were preserved the oil of the most venomous serpents, rhinoceros's horns, and woods of a subtle and penetrating odour procured from the interior of the Indies, together with a thousand other horrible rarities. This collection had been formed for a purpose like the present by Carathis herself, from a presentment that she might one day enjoy some intercourse with the infernal powers to whom she had ever been passionately attached and to whose taste she was no stranger. To familiarise herself the better with the horrors in view, the princess remained in the company of her negresses, who squinted in the most amiable manner from the only eye they had, and leered with exquisite delight at the skulls and skeletons which Carathis had drawn forth from her cabinets, whose key she entrusted to no one, all of them making contortions and uttering a frightful jargon, but very amusing to the princess, till at last, being stunned by their gibbering and suffocated by the potency of their exhalations, she was forced to quit the gallery after stripping it of a part of its treasures. Whilst she was thus occupied, the caliph, who instead of the visions he expected, had acquired in these insubstantial regions a voracious appetite, was greatly provoked at the negresses, for having totally forgotten their deafness, he had impatiently asked them for food, and seeing them regardless of his demand, he began to cough, pinch, and push them, till Carathis arrived to terminate the scene so indecent, 
to the great content of these miserable creatures who, having been brought up by her, understood all her signs and communicated in the same way their thoughts in return. "'Son, what means all this?' said she, panting for breath. "'I thought I heard as I came up the shrieks of a thousand bats tearing from their crannies in the recesses of a cavern. And it was the outcry only of these poor mutes, whom you were so unmercifully abusing. In truth, you but ill deserve the admirable provision I have brought you. Give it me instantly, exclaimed the caliph. I am perishing for hunger. As to that, answered she, you must have an excellent stomach if it can digest what I have been preparing. Be quick, replied the caliph, but, oh heavens, what horrors! What do you intend? Come, come, returned Carathis. Be not so squeamish, but help me to arrange everything properly, and you shall see that what you reject with such symptoms of disgust will soon complete your felicity. Let us get ready the pile for the sacrifice of to-night, and think not of eating till that is performed. Know you not that all solemn rites are preceded by a rigorous abstinence? The caliph, not daring to object, abandoned himself to grief, and the wind that ravaged his entrails, whilst his mother went forward with the requisite operations. Files of serpent's oil, mummies, and bones were soon set in order on the balustrade of the towers. The pile began to rise, and in three hours was many cubits high. At length a darkness approached, and Carathis, having stripped herself to her inmost garment, clapped her hands in an impulse of ecstasy and struck light with all her force. The mutes followed her example, but Vathek, extenuated with hunger and impatience, was unable to support himself, and fell down in a swoon. The sparks had already kindled the dry wood, the venomous oil burst into a thousand blue flames, the mummies dissolving emitted a thick dun vapour, and the rhinoceros's horns beginning to consume, altogether diffused such a stench that the caliph, recovering, started from his trance and gazed wildly on the scene in full blaze around him. The oil gushed forth in a plenitude of streams, and the negresses who supplied it without intermission united their cries to those of the princess. At last the fire became so violent and the flames reflected from the polished marble so dazzling that the caliph, unable to withstand the heat and the blaze, effected his escape, and clambered up the imperial standard. In the meantime the inhabitants of Samara, scared at the light which shone over the city, arose in haste, ascended their roofs, beheld the tower on fire, and hurried half-naked to the square. Their love to their sovereign immediately awoke, and apprehending him in danger of perishing in his tower, their whole thoughts were occupied with the means of his safety. Morakanabad flew from his retirement, wiped away his tears, and cried out for water like the rest. Bababalouk, whose olfactory nerves were more familiarised to magical odours, readily conjecturing that Carathis was engaged in her favourite amusements, strenuously exhorted them not to be alarmed. Him, however, they treated as an old poltroon, and forbore not to style him a rascally traitor. The camels and dromedaries were advancing with water, but no one knew by which way to enter the tower. Whilst the populace was obstinate in forcing the doors, a violent east wind drove such a volume of flame against them as that first forced them off, but afterwards rekindled their zeal. At the same time, the stench of the horns and mummies increasing, most of the crowd fell backward in a state of suffocation. Those that kept their feet mutually wondered at the cause of the smell, and admonished each other to retire. Morakanabad, more sick than the rest, remained in a piteous condition. Holding his nose with one hand, he persisted in his efforts with the other to burst open the doors and obtain admission. A hundred and forty of the strongest and most resolute at length accomplished their purpose. Having gained the staircase by their violent exertions, they attained a great height in a quarter of an hour. Carathis, alarmed at the signs of her mutes, advanced to the staircase, went down a few steps, and heard several voices calling out from below. 
you shall in a moment have water. Being rather alert, considering her age, she presently regained the top of the tower, and bade her son suspend the sacrifice for some minutes, adding, We shall soon be enabled to render it more grateful. Certain dolts of your subjects, imagining no doubt that we were on fire, have been rash enough to break through those doors which had hitherto remained inviolate, for the sake of bringing up water. They are very kind, you must allow, so soon to forget the wrongs you have done them, but that is of little moment. Let us offer them to the cure. Let them come up. Our mutes, who neither want strength nor experience, will soon dispatch them, exhausted as they are with fatigue. Be it so, answered the caliph, provided we finish and I dine. In fact, these good people, out of breath from ascending eleven thousand stairs in such haste, and chagrined at having spilt by the way the water they had taken, were no sooner arrived at the top than the blaze of the flames and the very fumes of the mummies at once overpowered their senses. It was a pity, for they beheld not the agreeable smile with which the mutes and the negresses adjusted the cord to their necks. These amiable personages rejoiced, however, no less at the scene. Never before had the ceremony of strangling been performed with so much facility. They all fell without the least resistance or struggle, so that Vathek, in the space of a few moments, found himself surrounded by the dead bodies of his faithfulest subjects, all which were thrown on the top of the pile. Carathis, whose presence of mind never forsook her, perceiving that she had carcasses sufficient to complete her oblation, commanded the chains to be stretched across the staircase, and the iron doors barricaded, that no more might come up. No sooner were these orders obeyed, than the tower shook, the dead bodies vanished in the flames, which at once changed from a swarthy crimson to a bright rose colour. An ambient vapour emitted the most exquisite fragrance. The marble columns rang with harmonious sounds, and the liquefied horns diffused a delicious perfume. Carathis, in transports, anticipated the success of her enterprise whilst her mutes and negresses, to whom these sweets had given the colic, retired to their cells, grumbling. Scarcely were they gone when, instead of the pile, horns, mummies, and ashes, the caliph both saw and felt, with a degree of pleasure which he could not express, a table covered with the most magnificent repast, flagons of wine and vases of exquisite sherbet floating on snow. He availed himself without scruple of such an entertainment, and had already laid hands on a lamb stuffed with pistachios, whilst Carathis was privately drawing from a filigree urn a parchment that seemed to be endless, and which had escaped the notice of her son. Totally occupied in gratifying an importunate appetite, he left her to peruse it without interruption, which, having finished, she said to him in an authoritative tone, Put an end to your gluttony, and hear the splendid promises with which you are favoured. She then read as follows. Vathek, my well-beloved, thou hast surpassed my hopes. My nostrils have been regaled by the savour of thy mummies, thy horns, and still more by the lives devoted on the pile. At the fall of the moon, cause the bands of thy musicians and thy timbrels to be heard. Depart from thy palace, surrounded by all the pageants of majesty, thy most faithful slaves, thy best beloved wives, thy most magnificent litters, thy richest laden camels, and set forward on thy way to Istakhar. There await I thy coming. That is the region of wonders. There shalt thou receive the diadem of Jan ben Jan, the talismans of Solomon, and the treasures of the pre-Adamite sultans. There shalt thou be solaced with all kinds of delight. But beware how thou enterest any dwelling on thy route, for thou shalt feel the effects of my anger. The caliph, who, notwithstanding his habitual luxury, had never before dined with so much satisfaction, gave full scope to the joy of these golden tidings, and betook himself to drinking anew. Carathis, whose antipathy to wine was by no means insuperable, failed not to supply a reason for every bumper, which they ironically quaffed to the health of Mahomet. This infernal liquor completed their impious temerity and prompted them to utter a profusion of blasphemies. They gave a loose to their wit at the expense of the ass of Balaam, the dog of the seven sleepers, 
and the other animals admitted into the paradise of Mahomet. In this sprightly humour they descended the eleven thousand stairs, diverting themselves as they went at the anxious faces they saw on the square through the oilets of the tower, and at length arrived at the royal apartments by the subterranean passage. Bababalouk was parading to and fro, and issuing his mandates with great pomp to the eunuchs, who were snuffing the lights and painting the eyes of the Circassians. No sooner did he catch the sight of the caliph and his mother than he exclaimed, Ha, you have then, I perceive, escaped from the flames. I was not, however, altogether out of doubt. Of what moment is it to us what you thought or think? cried Carathis. Go, speed. Tell Morakanabad that we immediately want him, and take care how you stop by the way to make your insipid reflections. Morakanabad delayed not to obey the summons, and was received by Vathek and his mother with great solemnity. They told him, with an air of composure and commiseration, that the fire at the top of the tower was extinguished, but that it had cost the lives of the brave people who sought to assist them. Still more misfortune, cried Morakanabad with a sigh. Ah, commander of the faithful, our holy prophet is certainly irritated against us. It behoves you to appease him. We will appease him hereafter, replied the caliph, with a smile that augured nothing of good. You will have leisure sufficient for your supplications during my absence, for this country is the bane of my health. I am disgusted with the mountains of, of the four fountains, and am resolved to go and drink of the stream of Rocknabad. I long to refresh myself in the delightful valleys which it waters. Do you, with the advice of my mother, govern my dominions, and take care to supply whatever her experiments may demand, for you will know that our tower abounds in materials for the advancement of science. The tower but ill suited Morakanabad's taste. Immense treasures had been lavished upon it, and nothing had he ever carried thither but female negroes, mutes, and abominable drugs. Nor did he know well what to think of Carathis, who, like a chameleon, could assume all possible colours. Her cursed eloquence had often driven the poor Mussulman to his last shifts. He considered, however, that if she possessed but few good qualities, her son had still fewer, and that the alternative on the whole would be in her favour. Consoled, therefore, with this reflection, he went in good spirits to soothe the populace and make the proper arrangements for his master's journey. Vathek, to conciliate the spirits of the subterranean palace, resolved that his expedition should be uncommonly splendid. With this view he confiscated on all sides the property of his subjects, whilst his worthy mother stripped the seraglios she visited of the gems they contained. She collected all the sempstresses and embroiderers of Samara and other cities to the distance of sixty leagues, to prepare pavilions, palanquins, sofas, canopies, and litters for the train of the monarch. There was not left in Masolipatan a single piece of chintz, and so much muslin had been brought up to dress out by Babaluk and the other black eunuchs, that there remained not an L in the whole Iraq of Babylon. During these preparations, Carathis, who never lost sight of her great object, which was to obtain favour with the powers of darkness, made select parties of the fairest and most delicate ladies of the city, but in the midst of their gaiety she contrived to introduce serpents among them, and to break pots of scorpions under the table. They all bit to a wonder, and Carathis would have left them to bite, were it not that, to fill up the time, she now and then amused herself in curing their wounds with an excellent anodyne of her own invention, for this good princess abhorred being indolent. Vathek, who was not altogether so active as his mother, devoted his time to the sole gratification of his senses in the palaces which were severally dedicated to them. He disgusted himself no more with the divan or the mosque. One half of Samara followed his example, whilst the other lamented the progress of corruption. End of part four.